All right, everyone, thanks for joining us today. So, thank, yeah, our aim today is to walk you through our VR work for the NHS, uh, which is speaking up in escalating concerns. Today, we will be discussing the development process from planning to delivery and highlighting the challenges and results, as well as the benefits of using Scenario VR. But who are we? So myself and my colleague Duncan are a part of Video Interact, specialists, specialists in interactive film and VR. So my name is Jack, as mentioned, and I'm a digital learning designer. I've been a, a part of the e-learning industry for several years now and have, as part of the Video Interact team, produced some award-winning learning content, as you can see, because we put it on the screen here. So I've been using Scenario VR personally for about four years now. And over the past couple of years, we've been using the tool to, to produce VR learning for the NHS. And I'll hand it over to Duncan now, who will give you a small introduction. Yeah, um, I'm Duncan, obviously. Um, just to let you know, the NHS the National Health Service, you know, which is um, like the Canadians, um, we have a publicly funded health service, and I'm sure all the Europeans will know that as well. Um, so we've been working, I think, in the NHS now for about a year and a half, um, which we really enjoy. Um, I've got a video background, so uh, I sort of complement Jack's skills, really. Yeah, so I, I kind of handle development in the VR sense or scenario VR lectora, kind of delivering it and getting out ready. But Duncan handles all of the filming and the, the handling of the scripts and the actors and that side of the video interact team. And they're brilliant at doing it. Makes my life easy when you get great footage to work with. Okay, so as mentioned, this presentation will follow our work for the Health Education England, which is kind of a part of the NHS. Can you explain that, Duncan? I don't completely know it fully. <laughs> yeah, no, Health Education England is um, obviously, there's actually 1.3 million people who work in the National Health Service in England, um, Europe's largest employer. And so as a result, they have a specialist education body who oversees all the education for all of the doctors and the nurses, because in, in the UK, um, the National Health Service basically trains all of the medical staff. Brilliant, thank you. Awesome. So yeah, so as mentioned, we're going to be focusing on our escalating concerns and speaking up course, but we will be mentioning, we will possibly, possibly will mention other courses we've done in the past as well, uh, such as the one on the right here, our stroke course for NHS Leicester. So if we do go off topic and talk about a stroke course, that's, that's just, that's what we're talking about. And if we do go very off topic, just um, drop us a message in the chat. All right, so let's get started. So we'll take a look at the following key points of the project of speaking up and escalating concerns. Uh, these are, number one, overview. What does it look like? What is this course? Number two, how was it built? Uh, number three, why scenario VR? Four, some challenges we came across. And lastly, looking at user feedback and the results we got from that. So what I'm going to do now is hopefully press play on a video and it's going to work perfectly and everyone can hear it. It's going to be about a minute long and it will give you a brief overview of the course. The video does have subtitles in case you're unable to hear it. Um, but if you want to watch it again later on, I'll give you a link towards the end of this session. It's going to work. There we go. The supported Return to Work training team have developed an interactive 360 VR resource, which follows Dr. Lucy Jones as she returns to work after a significant absence. Asked to cover a night shift, she negotiates with colleagues, patients, and their relatives, manages a genuine emergency, and quickly finds her feet again in the workplace. Viewers can see everything that happens, gain insights into the thoughts and feelings of Lucy's patients and her team, listen to expert testimony, and experience the roller coaster of a busy night shift. 
As they complete this immersive learning resource, health professionals will explore techniques and develop skills which will enable them to escalate concerns and speak up. They will develop their ability to manage challenging conversations and situations, skills that are increasingly recognized as contributing to the quality and safety of care for patients. I hope that wasn't too choppy for everyone and everyone heard it and it all went brilliantly. Was oh, good. Was good. We all heard it. It was good. Fantastic. Brilliant. Um, Duncan, do you just want to give kind of a little bit of an overview of the course as well as that video in your own words? Um, well, in addition to what we've got in front of this, this structure here, do you want me oh. to talk through that, Jane? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, kind of okay. A, yeah. um, so... Um, actually, I'll go a little bit off script here, because what we've discovered subsequently since launching this course is that we've had a comparison of this course to four others which were in the same programme. Um, and uh, the amazing thing I think about this course specifically is a soft skills course, um, as were all the others. And the really interesting thing I think about for Scenario VR and this course compared to the other four courses in the program that didn't use, which were all VR um, and all filmed VR as well, but they didn't use Scenario VR to develop them, was just how good Scenario VR enabled us to make this course really. And it all started from the planning, the planning by the medical professionals and also our head of production, um, Laura, Laura Cade and Jack as well. And if you get that planning right to start with and you know exactly what you're gonna do, it feeds into the way that you're gonna produce it, in this case, filming it. So as I said here, what you need is immersion movement and we chose to have experts um, in sort of there. Then obviously you edit that, you develop um, uh, the scenario VR. Then we went through the client review, piloted the course, we got the feedback, we added the accessibilities and lectoral integration that Jack will um, uh, talk about subsequently and deliver it. But the other facet, that we've had recently is just how well this course performed compared to the other ones in the program so mm. brilliant yeah thank you for that so we'll go through each step in detail not too much detail but kind of a an in-depth overview that makes sense um but yeah as, as duncan mentioned we, it all started with the planning i just it's too many windows open hang on <laughs> So for a project like this to be successful, we need to make sure everyone is on the same page. So what we did, we had a planning meeting with the client and this helped us create a, co a coherent vision for the learning, which everyone was happy with. It helped, uh, helped us build a good relationship with the client. Uh, it helped us build bridges. So thoughts, ideas and even concerns can easily be shared between us. And it also allowed us to share our experience with not only creating the content, but also giving advice on delivery methods and accessibility. So I was introduced at this stage uh, for one of two reasons. Uh, firstly, to reassure the client that what they were requesting will work in Scenario VR. And secondly, I can use my Scenario VR experience to suggest new ideas and ways of effectively presenting the information in Scenario VR. Mm -hmm. Now, what we did in the past was I may be too busy for this step or I wasn't involved at this stage and the client would have ideas which were a bit out there <laughs> and a bit too much for what a, some, a normal e-learning tool could do. So I really enjoyed being included in, included in this stage because it just helped me kind of connect with the client and really understand what they want rather than just having it as emails back and forth it was just we're in the same room we're here to kind of get our creative juices going and it, yeah it went really well hmm. so during this meeting we also used our previous um, CVR work with Leicester University Hospital so this is the stroke scene I mentioned earlier 
uh, just so the client had an idea how everything would look and feel. So it was really important to have that demo in the room showing the client because we would say things to them and they'd have no idea what we're talking about. So just have that visual example of what we're going to do. And they, they, they were really happy with it and it just gave them the confidence that we knew what we were talking about as well. Um, so by the end of the meeting, they understood our methodology and what we could do with Scenario VR. Anything to add there, Duncan? No, I was just, you know, as all I was going to say was that um, people's expectations of VR products are often game-based. And what we what needed to create here in a soft skills course um, using video or film really was the interrelationship and the reaction between the different characters that you have because you know you inherit you naturally tune into that and what it feels like in this particular course is you accompany the doctor the, um, who's coming back to work because it's about a doctor coming back to work basically after um, a time of significant absence you feel like you're on her shoulder so you see how she responds to her colleagues you see how her colleagues and the patients respond to her um and you know that's quite a sophisticated concept to get across um uh, but sitting down with you know uh, the people from health education england and the doctors here we it was just so crucial at this stage so mm. yeah it was a really enjoyable day as well just getting everyone together had a really good time day out of the office lovely all right, so once we had confirmed the storyboard and the scripts for the client, it was time to film. So I'm just going to give you some stats and figures for filming and Duncan will tell you the rest because I wasn't there on the day he was so he can tell you everything about it. So filming took place over one and a half days. The, the 360 filming and the one-to-one -one interviews were filmed on the simulation ward. Any one-to-one -one interviewees unable to attend on the day were filmed via Zoom, as we're doing now. And a bunch of equipment was used, which is on screen, so I'm not going to read them all out. And Duncan will tell you more about it. Yeah, I mean, this is our world, really. This is what we do. This is what we love to do. So you can see Laura standing by the door there, who's the director. It's a small crew. You've got Jack, the cameraman. Um, and Al as well, really. And this is the type of equipment that we use. You know, it's not, it's professional equipment, but it's not really expensive, you know. And it just took us a day and a half to film all of the content that we needed for this, which involved five actors as patients and nine medics, really. So, what about the extras? You had to film some extras on the day because they, they wanted to be involved was it <laughs> yeah what happened was it word got around that we were doing this and actually it was health education england who booked the actors we hadn't auditioned them um so it was the first time that laura had met them on the day um a whole bunch of we were expecting four doctors to come along five more turned up laura asked them what their speciality um was and basically wrote them into the scene so included them into the scene so we she built other aspects on the day i wouldn't recommend doing that necessarily but laura's very experienced so she could handle it very easily for me you know i would just have to run away at that stage it'd be too much for me but laura's good with that so yeah you ne never underestimate people wanting to be a movie star <laughs> yeah you just have to control it <laughs> yes 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 <laughs> yeah i mean i was saying recently you have to plan as much as you can but you also need to kind of allow that time to okay something may change where you're not expecting it so it's always good to kind of have that extra half day or a but day. to give you a real insider tip on this this is this is the key for we're, we're doing lots of healthcare orientated work at the moment and of course we're not healthcare professionals so we have to rely on the subject matter um, experts on the shoot and, and subsequently as well obviously um but what we tend to do is not employ actors but to use healthcare professionals because they know the language 
that they use, that we get them to do their normal jobs in front of the camera. And if they they start forgetting that they're in front of the camera and they are themselves. And we're lucky enough to work with some really good people like that, good doctors, good nurses, and it comes across really well. Because mm. it, yeah, it's so natural because it is natural. Exactly. An and that's what you want. You, you yeah. want a really naturalistic experience. Mm. Brilliant. Okay. Running over to the next one. So the footage was edited over 15 days in Adobe Premiere Pro. This is because there was a lot of footage. Um, this footage was then sent over to myself to begin scenario VR development. Our video editor, Jack Hill, isn't here today. But if you do have any specific questions regarding editing 360 video, we can put you in touch with him. Uh, but just a couple of tips for you when editing. So in a scenario VR tip, the 360 scenes were reduced from their native 4K resolution to a HD resolution of 1920 by 960. Uh, this was done for, again, two reasons. Firstly, to help it run smoother on multiple devices. So having that HD resolution lets me know that on a mobile, it will run smoothly. On a desktop, it will run smoothly. On a headset, it will run smoothly. Ideally, on a desktop and a headset, you'd want that 4K because it can cope with that. But the mobile can't cope well with 4K footage. It gets a bit choppy, especially if there's a lot going on. So for this one, we kind of reduced that down to make sure it works across the board. And the second reason was to simply reduce the final size of the package. So the client's platform had a, a limit of two gigabytes and there was a lot of footage in here. So I think it kind of started out as about six gigabytes worth of learning. So we had to reduce that down and reducing that resolution really helped with that. Yeah, just, just a tip on filming and editing. And I'm sure many of you will know this anyway. It's like, we always get more than we need. Mm. Um, and also if the, if the direct the, the people generally who do the editing in our case it's a guy called Jack Hill he's one of the cameramen so he knows naturally you know because he's been filmed it on the day what is likely to be the best one of the best takes um and you know if the director um in this case Laura is there too um she has experienced that as well so between them they cut down the amount of footage that you've taken to just the real key nuggets very easily because you know they were there yeah and and it's great because because they were there you can just ask them a question saying because i wasn't there i don't know what this bit's about what's this bit about and they go oh yeah that was tweaked slightly because of these yeah. reasons we often yeah. invite jack but he finds some excuse you know <laughs> Awesome. All right. Next point. So scenario VR development. So this is kind of where I come in again. Where to begin? So to quickly recap, we have all of the footage that's all been edited. And I have a storyboard to work from, which outlines the content. Um, I love making storyboards for scenario VR because it just helps me visualize everything. And as I'm writing it, I go, oh, it'll be great to add this and it'll be great to add that. In. You can just have the script if you want, but you really need to turn that into a storyboard purpose built for the authoring tool, just to make it very clear of what you're creating and that you know what's going to come down the road. So if I'm creating a quick quiz here, I know I need to create 10 more or something like that. Hopefully not that many, um, but an activity, the one earlier where you click on the pace, so the P-A-C-E, I knew that was going to be included about four times. So I knew I needed to perfect that the first time so that I can then duplicate, duplicate it throughout the course. Are there any sample storyboards available? Um, so I tend to just keep it simple. I, I use a Word document and a table that it just reduces the time creating the storyboard for me. I can visualize it in my mind, what it's gonna be, and I write notes alongside it. Uh, I won't try and find one now because it will take a lot of time, but <laughs> yes, I, I tend to keep it simple. So initial development for this project in Scenario VR took around two weeks and the majority of visuals were produced in Adobe Photoshop, um, such as the text and the user interface buttons, icons, etc. Uh, I think I mentioned that. Um, and yeah, so again, when testing, so for example, earlier I mentioned the pace things, getting that right the first time. 
um, I love the preview feature in Scenario VR because you can just quickly toggle it on. You can see if it's working well, you can test that. And then once you know it's great, you can then copy that further down. Uh, the course was quite big in Scenario VR purely because the number of 360 videos in there. Uh, but what we did was we turned into a, a, a menu. Hang on, let, let me show you. So this is a demo of the course. You can find this on our website, videointract.com. If you click play demo here. So if I click start here, what we have is a station with all of the beds and the scenes which we can jump to. Now in the real course, it will unlock one at a time and it will highlight the one you're working on next. For this demo, we've just highlighted a couple for you. And it really just keeps it nice and clear what you're supposed to be doing next. So if I came into this scene and I only saw this bit of the scene, I go, oh, okay, I'm definitely doing that. Uh, we also use the pan to feature here. So if I come into the scene or if I'm looking elsewhere, it automatically takes me to where I should be going next, which was great. Um, yeah, any comments here, Duncan? No, no, it's fine. No, I, I think it just went really well. So things included in here were we used a lot of the timeline events um, specifically for subtitles, which we'll get to later on, but also for other events within the scene. Uh, we used little features like this. So this is a character card that pops up so you can learn more about the patient. Once that's done, I have a button here where I can pause the scene if I need to go out <laughs> to the toilet or anything, or if someone interrupts me, I can replay the scene, I can jump back to the main menu. Um, or, as you saw with that pop-up card, I can jump to this scene and I can learn more about that, about the character again. So these are all locked because I haven't unlocked them yet, but this one is unlocked because I've seen it and I can learn more about it. And then I can jump back to my previous location. Uh, so this menu here is something that I typically add in because it's a nice minimal, minimalistic icon where it's kind of down below, but it's not in your face. It's it's faded out a bit. When you hover over it, it highlights, you click on it and then more buttons appear. Uh, it's just a nice way of doing it. I've never had any complaints from clients about it. So if you wanted to make a menu, I'd recommend something like this. Right, back to the presentation. So why Scenario VR? I would say, so this is my list here. So creative freedom, ease of use, device agnostic, Lectora integration, and I've had great experiences with it previously. So your Scenario VR course can be as simple or as complex as you need it to be. So it could be 30, 360 scenes, it could be five, it could have 10 different activities in one scene it could have two it's really up to you and how you want to present it mm. uh, without much experience you are able to quickly put together a functional 360 vr course and publish it to multiple channels um, including scenario vr live which is the purpose-built scenario vr publish output uh, scorm html and xapi as well as now being able to view it on, as John Blackman was mentioning earlier, Windows Offline and Hybrid Score. And all of these are compatible with mobile tablets, VR headsets and desktop, which is perfect. Uh, a question. Mixing 360 video as well as regular footage. Uh, so what we do, we tend to do is we have I'll see if I can get it up here. I jump to a different scene. So we tend to like doing it this way, where I think Duncan would say we use the 360 scene as a vessel. There's some voice over here. That's why it's yeah. taking a while. It'll come along in a minute. Yeah. But we'd use the 360 scene as a vessel. So the main content and the main narrative and storyline is happening in that 360. However, where there are opportunities to teach the learner about other things or if there's other things you want to include in that scene you can do something like this where here's a character card but for this one we have a pop-up interview as well so we have this in the 360 scene uh, we tend to do this a lot we like doing it it's a great way of keeping information all in the same place about turning everything 360 because this doesn't need to be 360 it, it's great mm -hmm. as kind of a normal 
purpose-built video. Yeah, it just works great. Yeah, the, I would say that the advantage about 360 is that you know where you are, literally, because mm. you can look around the place and you can be introduced to different people. Um, and if you look on, for instance, one of the very first pieces that we did was South Wales Fire and Rescue, which you'll find on uh, the Scenario VR and the Learning Brother, um, early Le e-learning brothers um, website and also on the app is that we tend to use um the 360 as a vessel as i say with different tiles and one of the things that we find is really important in a course like this is that because it's it's a big course and there's a lot of information there is if you have to guide the learner through it really and one of the best ways to do that we think is that when you've got 360 going on here for instance you put detail in a separate place that can be optional can be mandatory for the viewer to get into but it doesn't confuse the overall thing and the other thing as well as from an aesthetic point of view is that the 360 cameras that we've used doesn't tend to give you such a good definition as our linear or standard film cameras, if you like. And so we like to produce a product to the highest possible um, uh, standards. So we like to mix the two, really. Yeah, and the benefits of doing that as well is you can take those 2D videos and you can put them elsewhere. Yeah. So for example, for this one, we had some extra footage which didn't quite fit in the course. Mm -hmm. but the client then included that on their on their site on their learning site not as mm -hmm. part of this course but as additional resources which is great mm -hmm. um so yeah just to recap on what that question was about so from that main menu you jump into these which are more 360 scenes and then if there's any additional information on top of this we'd have that as 2d video pop-ups mm -hmm. so this is one of the activities that's going on here I actually got that right i can't believe it without, even without sound but there we go so um, the doctor he was mentioning a probe question so we've acknowledged that we've clicked on the p the scene's been paused it's it's, it's acknowledged we're correct and we press continue to carry on mm. and at the end we'll get a score saying you've got four out of five for example all right because the important thing to us as well is is that with using scenario vr and all its 360 capabilities in video is that it's not just about being in the 360 it's about giving people things to do and react to all the time exactly. perfect um yeah so using scenario vr uh, with more experience you'll be able to really push the boundaries of the tool so thinking of new and creative ways of displaying information. Uh, and I think that's the great thing about 360 VR at the moment is that there is no one way of doing things. So you could be that person that kind of changes the trend and the way the learning is experienced in 360. Mm -hmm. um, and Scenario VR is a great platform to do that because there are no restrictions on what you can do with it. You can design it however you want. I'm just going to respond to a little question here from um, Anna. Um, there's a glitch on the website at the moment that we're fixing. So, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. So, that but you the can find also that the, Command of the, the Ocean. Isn't, it? isn't yeah. that also in the public area scenario of VR, Command of the Ocean? Yes, I believe yes, it so. is. Yeah, so if you just go yeah, to the public area of scenario VR, you can also find it there. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Awesome. So another huge bonus of using Scenario VR is the ability to seamlessly integrate your learning with Lectora. And as John mentioned earlier, other authoring tools are available. <laughs> this was done for this project and it was such a pleasant surprise for it to work so well. More of this later on. Uh, but I personally use Scenario VR because it gives me creative freedom. I'm not restricted by any sort of template. I have true creative freedom to produce whatever the client needs and whatever I can imagine. Great. So as you did spot earlier, and I've already talked about them, so mm -hmm. I'll, I'll kind of gloss over this, but yeah, we added a couple of new activities for these for this course. Uh, these were thought of during that planning discussion. So the client had their own ideas on how to do things and we'd go, actually, what if you took this approach? So we suggested this and then they really liked it. And this is kind of where it grew from. So did we have to create and import graphics or were they all created in the scenario of your program so i personally created my 
graphics and everything inside Adobe Photoshop as well as Illustrator. Um, I find that's the best way. Of Me personally, that's the way I work. Scenario VR does has it does have its own kind of standard set of buttons and icons, which I'm sure John Blackman can comment on and show you. Uh, but I tend to create my own. Um, the Learning Brothers suite also includes resources. They have pre-made icons and things like that, which you can download and use, which is great as well. For the record, all of the actions that are in Scenario VR were also actually created by Jack a long time ago. Now we've updated them since then, but the original set of actions that are in Scenario VR were Jack's <laughs> work. So just thought I'd go there. Plagiarism. It's not plagiarism. I ask you, you know, I asked you if we could use them. You said yes. <laughs> yeah, but you get the checks though, Jack, don't you? <laughs> yeah. yeah, still waiting for it. <laughs> Uh, no, it's, it's all good. It's, all, it's nice every time I go and I go, oh, that's my arrow. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> they've, they've improved a little bit, so that's good. It's good to see. <laughs> uh, all right, I won't touch these because we've already talked about it and I don't think they're working anyway because I've already shown you. All right, client review. So the client reviewed both the course functionality and the videos. So rather than giving the client the edited videos to review straight away, we felt it was more time efficient to knock two birds with one stone here and have the client review the videos as part of that 360 VR scenario. There are pros and cons of doing it this way. Uh, the, firstly, the pros, it helped us reduce the number of recycles and it helped us give the client context for the videos within the user experience. The cons of doing it this way is if there are edits that need to be made to those 360 videos and we've already put timed events and actions all in there those would all have to be tweaked to adjust to the new video time so it's kind of you take some you lose some it's really what you want to go with on that one i would personally recommend giving the videos as by themselves to the client to review beforehand because then you know they're perfect the client signed them off and you know there won't be any changes within scenario vr and if there are there'll be minimal ones uh, yeah, so once we received the client's feedback, we implemented the changes and it was onto the pilot. So great okay, this is a really interesting process, actually, if I can just chip in, Jack, because this was during the pandemic. So we were meant to do it face to face. We couldn't do it face to face. Uh, um, Health Education England for the NHS set up this remote um, session, really, where we were allowed to be in, um, but they led it and engage with, there was over 50 um, health professionals who were just going through the course live, basically, and then commenting on it. It was just, it was a brilliant exercise. You know, we love doing this because usually we don't have the opportunity to do this. Mm. Yeah, it was fantastic. Um, just having that real, real time feedback as well. Like it, it's your work and you put it out there and usually get client feedback, but you never really get actual user feedback while you're developing the course still yeah so it was just fantastic knowledge to gain mm -hmm. the whole process lasted a day uh with the pilots research in the morning and the focus groups in the afternoon so everyone did the pilot course but then selected users were chosen for the focus groups to give us more feedback uh so yeah, so, so the feedback was invaluable, not only for this project, but for any other future projects we produce, because now we, we know how the user works, especially within VR. I believe I did write more on this, but I can't see it. Mm. Oh, here it is. There's a whole slide about it. <laughs> so the overall feedback was extremely positive. Um, some key things that were presented were, so this is kind of the two big things that came back to us from the feedback. Some users were very unfamiliar with 360 VR and didn't understand the concept of dragging around the screen to look for more. So people would just be looking at one segment on the screen and they didn't realize they could actually look around. So we rectified this by included an, including an interactive tutorial in which we asked the user to drag the screen around to continue. So this is just a really quick, this is how you do it, move on. Uh, we did have it as a longer piece, but looking at it with the client, we felt it was a bit patronizing to the people who did know how to do it, and it was a bit much. So it was just a very simple, let's try it out, drag over here, great, you got it, let's go, carry on. And the second thing which we had from the 
users were some people found the situations and scenarios within this course to be a bit emotionally overwhelming due to their past experiences. Mm. Uh, so this led us to adding a disclaimer at the beginning of the learning to signpost that some scenes may be challenging and even anxiety provoking. Uh, do you want to touch on that, Duncan? Yeah, we loved it, really. I mean, can you imagine having to put a trigger warning into a training course because it's so naturalistic and realistic? Mm. You know, so we're going, oh, yes, of course, we'll do that. But we're sort of thinking to ourselves, yes, you know, <laughs> if it really gets to people, you know, in the nicest possible way, um, emotionally, it means that you're, you know, you're engaging with the audience. Exactly. Yeah, one thing I would say that we found during this process that we were aware of before, but we really discovered a lot of the training that um, the National Health Service has to be has to be done very quickly. And so it's sort of regular e-learning, if you like. The problem when you're producing a course like this, that is not necessarily what the majority of the audience expect, because they haven't necessarily been given anything like this before or experienced anything like this, is that you have to be really careful because they're, they're not as critical as you want them to be sometimes. So, you know, so, so what we found, I, I referred before um, th that this course was part of a whole program of courses that were similarly developed, um, but and lots of them had really good and enthusiastic feedback to start with. But subsequently, we found, and we've got some data on it at the end, that our course was actually, this particular course was much more successful than the other ones was. But I think part of that is because, you know, if you're used to normally learning, if you like, you know, that isn't particularly well produced, for instance, you're given something like this, then you've just got to be very, very aware, you know, are you hitting that button? Are you doing exactly what you need to, to get the best possible response out of the audience? Mm. Hey, there was a guys. There was a question earlier that uh, when they had something popped up about your equipment list. Do 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 you have it? Can you mention the kind of the brand and kind of equipment you had when you were filming? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's all on here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. If you That's... want a screenshot, if not, I can copy and paste that in the chat later on, or Duncan can do that. Yeah. Uh, okay. Great. Yeah. Or email us. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, oh, your production is still showing your lighting for 360. Ah, do you know that, Duncan? What's that? <laughs> do you have kind of a an example, an image of how the lighting was set up for 360? For, for a 360 shoot, because that is lighting for 360 is a question, right? Because you don't. Want yeah, that. Um, you have... we don't tend to use. Um, we tend to use natural light, especially in 360, because. Otherwise, you, the lights get in the shot. Yeah. yeah you bright. know, the lights here, you can see the lights here are, you know, the newer pack dimmable lights, basically, but we tend to use natural light. So, indirect see, lighting works also, well. If you can light a wall from beneath something, so it's displaying a wall, that does. Yeah, I, you know. You know, this is, um, in our experience, we haven't had a big issue with it, to be honest, John. So, um, in the, you know, in a way, we had to downgrade the quality of this um, uh, uh, to, you know, work in the in the client's environment anyway. You know, so as, as Jack said, you know, we usually shoot in 4K. You can shoot in much higher standards, you know, but... Um, you have to be aware of where your customer is going to put and they're going to play this material from a lot of the time. You know, we're not we're not talking about Hollywood quality images really here because you're not going to show them on massive screens. So, yeah, yeah and I think the key thing as well is making sure you choose a place to film that is well lit or as as well lit as it can be. Uh, so that's all in yeah. your mind stage. It's going, oh, these rooms are quite dark. Do you have anywhere else that's similar, which we can film instead? Because it's it's not going to look great on the camera. So there are things you can do beforehand just to kind of remove that risk of it being looking like a dungeon, you know? 
<laughs> All right, this, where was I? There I was. So I'm just going to touch on this. I won't spend too long on it because we're running out of time. But accessibility, so for this, we use subtitles. The subtitles were added in via info cards in Scenario VR. So we'd have info cards along the bottom of the screen, and these would show and hide depending on the event timings. Uh, transcriptions, we used a, a tool called Happy Scribe, where we'd simply upload the footage, it would transcribe it for us. We'd send those transcriptions over to the client because it had quite a few medical terms in there just to make sure it's all right. Once it was good, we'd re-import it, download it, done. So we did that for the 2D videos. For the 360 videos, we imported it as actual info cards on top of the footage because it, it just it has clearer quality. It it's, gives it more clarity. Uh, screen readers. John, do you want to answer that? What do you have here? Do you need to worry about screen readers? And if so, does it have deal well with them? No, uh, it, it does not work with uh, screen readers. Uh, you know, normally a lot of what you're doing inside of an immersive video is working with, uh, you know, recognizing things in the scene, looking around the scene. It's, it's exercising your audio and visual uh, you know, senses. And so, no, it does not, it does not really work with screen readers. Great. Yeah, I think one area where we could have improved on this one would be fixing the subtitles onto the screen. So we had some technical challenges of that with the target device not liking it at all. So we had to kind of unfix them and have them in the appropriate area on the screen. So not ideal, but that's kind of the way we had to do it. Uh, and just lastly on subtitles. So these were added to give the course or to aid accessibility helping with any audio impaired individuals. It also opens up opportunities to translate the learning in the future. So it would just be a matter of switching out subtitle language, which is super nice and easy to do. So, all right, lector integration. So John was touching on this earlier. I'm just gonna talk about it again quickly. We were informed quite late in the day that a survey and certificate were required. So this is something we couldn't add in Scenario VR. And we've gone, and we've gone, oh no, what are we gonna do? But thank goodness for Lectora. Because was it complicated? No, it was simple. So we, we exported the Scenario VR package as a HTML file, and then we imported that into Lectora Online. We built this certificate and survey as Lectora pages. And these would be triggered to show when the user finishes the scenario VR experience. So as an outline, I think you can kind of see it on the right here. Sorry, it's not zoomed in more, but we had our start page, which was in Lectora. And then we had, oh no, sorry, the start page was the scenario VR. Hang on, where is it? It's at the top, VR training folder. I'm looking in the image and it's very tiny, apologies. So we had our VR page, we had our Lectora page with scenario VR on it in the HTML frame. And then once that was finished, it would trigger on down actions to take us to the end resources, which included uh, request the survey and the certificate. It worked great. Any questions, feel free to contact. I didn't talk about that very well, but <laughs> I can explain it better by email and things. Uh, I also have a blog up somewhere on the transition website, I believe, which there may be a link to it at the end, just showing how you do this. Delivery, Duncan, would you like the honors? Yeah, yeah. So we launched this course in um, March. Um, and as I said, you know, it's currently available to a million users, over a million users on multiple devices. And yeah, the, the, vast, the huge advantage of that is that in an organization like the National Health Service, you can't, everybody can't afford to have a headset. So I think the preferred choice that people have to watch this is either on a desktop, um, a laptop, or um, on a tablet. On a previous course that we did 
for the National Health Service, the stroke course that um, Jack mentioned, it was specifically designed for mobiles. Um, but this course was just a bit too big physically. It looks a bit too big because you've got a doctor coming into a ward environment often and they would have a number of colleagues present and a number of patients. So that wasn't, mobile wasn't our preferred um, uh, you know, um, device, if you like. Um, so because we had to think of, you know, how is it, how is this going to be most popularly viewed? Mm. Great, thank you. Uh, moving on to challenges, we don't have much time left, so we will fly through these. I think we've mentioned most of them before, but just to touch on them again. So firstly, file size, we've mentioned this. I won't talk about that too much, but it was just a case of reducing the video quality to kind of reach that file size limit to get below that. And also involved us taking out some footage which didn't quite fit into the content and didn't need to be there. And then the client had that on their, on their learning space outside of the course. Uh, 360 subtitles, I mentioned that earlier. Uh, getting learners used to the 360 experience. Again, touched on that earlier. That was great. So that was adding a tutorial on how to do it. Uh, optimal 360 camera positioning. Uh, I think these are all for you, Duncan, the rest of them. <laughs> so I'll, I'll Yeah, I'll just mention that. What we find is really nice if you're shooting in 360, then you use the environment as much as possible. So that means even if you've got a fairly static environment, you put the camera where places will people walk around it and things like that and then you use pan to as well to focus on the person who's actually talking so um and the the thing we would always say about 360 vr when you're producing something in 360 vr um is why are you doing it like that and why is it going to give a better learning experience and for us in this course apart from uh, giving the course a natural flow, you know, if you use the optional um, camera positioning well, it was all about emotion and people's responses. So for us, this was, we work, in, we love to work in video. And so it was to make the best use of video that came on to, I mentioned before, the naturalistic performances, the medics um, and the actors, because it's soft skills. Um, and Obviously, that was backed up by the it being technically accurate that the you know the actual medics are speaking in the normal language in the way that they would do, and I mentioned at the bottom just sound to start with. It's very overlooked often um, during the pandemic, especially people got used to not so good quality pictures, but they still really really like good sound. So. You know, this is one of the tips that um, Jack and Al, who do the filming the whole time, saying is just get the sound right as you best possibly can. That's why we use uh, the Zoom mics, if you like. But at the end of the day, for a course like this to work really well, it's about the plan, the narrative, the story and the flow. Because as we were talking about this course this morning with um, another customer and they say what they really like about it is the way that you're led through it if you like you're given challenges but it's it does just feel very natural mm. yeah I was, I was talking to jack about the sound the other day and it's great having each person within the scene having their own microphone set up yeah. so that if you need to raise anyone's voice or lower anyone's voice it's so easy to do in edit yeah and it means you don't have everyone talking over each other someone could be talking about something it doesn't even matter especially in an emergency scene where there's multiple people talking uh, so it, it's great to have each individual person microphone so you have that person's voice and then you can raise them up or lower them where needed yeah all right, user feedback, we're almost done. So we won't stay on this slide too long. Just, just ask, <laughs> ask if you wonder. There's a, there's a question on the mics. That's Is that the Zoom H4n, correct? The microphone? Yeah, use? yeah the Zoom H4n. Hmm. Well, the, no, the Rode are the wireless mics, the four, times four Rode wireless mics, and the Zoom are the recorders. Okay. Hmm. Got it. Great. 
so that you know the little the little mics look like the mics that you use that the news people use all the whole time you know and if you're outdoors then you have those little furry bits on so yeah you know, the wind doesn't um, affect them there is a question if you're able to answer it about what the total cost to produce the training would be the total cost of this yeah yeah we can't give that out because I it's confidential. I, I, <laughs> so. I mention it. Yeah, I didn't think so. <laughs> I do like a Dr. Evil zoom in like that. One, one, <laughs> one million dollars. <laughs> All right. So initial no, data. What I would say is that um, because they're obviously a public body, then the National Health Service and Health Education England train um, courses are very competitively priced. So, because you wouldn't get the work unless you do it like that, really. So, but our approach is, is that we love working for the NHS um, and Health Education England. So we always throw our all into it, really. So. Mm. Great. Fantastic. Uh, I think that is the end. This, this is just a nice quote we got from one of the users. And I'm going to press next in three, two, one, done. All right, QR codes and links if anyone's interested. Um, if, you'd, if you would like any demos or anything extra from us, do get in contact. Uh, I didn't add in the contact information, but if you go to our website at videointeract.co.uk, uh, I'll type it in the chat. All the contact information is in there. Um, great. Thank you for okay. having us. Uh, any any more questions? I think that's it. Yep, I think that's it. Uh, fantastic, guys. That was really great. Uh, really enjoyed it. Always uh, always good to see you guys. Yeah, you and, too. Uh, yes, and uh, we'll, we'll see you again at Learning Technologies, I guess, uh, next year. Yeah, look forward to it. <laughs>